Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. So, July is at an end. We are now in August. Yeah, July was kind of an awesome month. Like, I feel like this July was a lot about things that have been hard or that I've been working on or working through the last probably like two years, three years, really kind of like culminated well. Uh, I had a really wonderful birthday with my family and I feel like had some good kind of like restorative time with them. I got to go visit my best friend in LA and we had some really good just like heart discussion kind of things and yeah and then I also got a new job and it's a job that I think really represents me moving forward in a really positive direction after having kind of some like angst about what I was doing and I think like really regaining some confidence in myself at work. Um, I think a lot of women, myself included, sometimes have imposter syndrome and yeah I think just like this month I really was able to tell myself like girl you are really good at what you do and you need to start like being more like owning that more and living into that. So anyway, I am so excited. I start a new job at the end of this month. I'm gonna have a couple of weeks off, which will be really nice. I'm getting out of an environment that was not really healthy for me, um, just because it was so boring and there was nothing to do. Uh, I'm very like super thankful because I was able to move to Nashville with a job. So like glad to have had that little kind of contracting role, but uh, I'm really, I'm excited about kind of the direction I'm going in. And so all that being said, July was just like a really positive month, like probably the best month I've had in a really long time. That being said, I was looking at my stats for reading and it wasn't my best reading month, though there were some definite highlights. Uh, there were also quite a lot of lowlights. With that very long rambly introduction, let me do some stats and then I will talk to you about my hits, my disappointments, and my surprises. I'll start with my disappointments probably because there's a lot of those and yeah. You'll see. So we've got my July wrap up. I did read 22 books in the month of July. That is actually an all time high. So I started tracking stats for myself in 2011. And this is the most books I've ever read in a July since I started tracking. So good job me. Of those 22 books, 17 of them were on my uh, like my own TBR and five of them were from the library. I listened to one audiobook. I read six physical books and I read 15 ebooks. I had a really diverse this is one of the most diverse sets of reading I've had uh, in a while I was really just hopping all over the place um, you can see these are all genres that I read frequently uh, you know a little mystery a little memoir um, more lit fic than normal which was kind of a nice change a little bit of romance some nonfiction a couple of fantasies uh, several what I would call genre blends so that's things like urban fantasy or just things that don't quite have a neat classification uh, a couple of short stories and uh, one thing that I guess I, I was calling YA because I was I guess it was historical YA. There you go. I always feel a little weird about considering YA genre, but that's like, that's probably a video unto itself. Anyway, moving on. Total amount I read was a little bit more than last month in terms of number of pages, though the average page length for me was a little bit down, so just under 300. I was reading a lot of things that came out uh, in 2018 this month. Um, I was looking through kind of my distribution. I read a lot of 2018 books, so my average age of book was only one year. And yeah, as you can see, average time on TBR 53 days. I think all of my library books were new releases, so that is, you know, probably makes uh, or contributes to that somewhat because you know you have to get through library books pretty quickly and yeah my average rating was right at three uh, three stars 3.05 um, which on my scale a three star book means that it was fine like it was good it met my expectations it wasn't anything amazing it wasn't anything terrible it was just like good um, so that's not bad necessarily I think I tend to feel like I had a better reading month if the average is closer to like a 3.5 but you know it wasn't under three so I guess that is a good thing in terms of distribution. I had one five-star book, uh, no 4.5-star books. I should have taken that out. Sorry about that. Um, five four-star books, three 3.5, seven at three, and then under there, yeah, I had one two-star and two one-stars. Um, 
almost always if I give something a one star, it means I DNF'd it. It is extremely rare for me to continue in an, in an entire book that I am not enjoying and give it a one star. Um, but if I DNF it, uh, that means that I've read enough of it that I feel confident in rendering a verdict. I suffered through enough to earn giving it a star rating. So yeah, that is my stats. So let's dive, let's go ahead and dive into those disappointments because that's that's where the real meat of this video is. So several of these disappointing books didn't necessarily get the worst rating from me. Um, that's why I always say hits versus disappointments because sometimes I'll put something in a disappointment that's even like 3.5 or four stars, but it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be or it was in some way a little bit disappointing. Um, and I would put this first book in that category and that is Toil and Trouble, which is a collection with a lot of authors. I think the first one listed is Tessa Sharp. Not sure who she is. Uh, yeah, this is a collection that's been very hyped. Like I've seen people talking about this collection, which comes out, I believe sometime in August for, my, I mean, since the beginning of the year. This was on people's most anticipated 2018 book lists. So yeah, this has been a very hyped book and it was fine. I think I gave it a three point or what did I give it? I gave it a three star. Uh, so yeah, that to me means it was perfectly fine. I'm not totally sure what the hype is about. It is cool subject matter. So it is YA short stories about witchcraft and women. Um, so yeah, that's like a cool idea. Uh, it's a cool kind of premise for a collection. And yeah, I'm always in favor of people reading short stories. So like I, this is like a project that I get behind in terms of what it's trying to do. I just don't think that the stories were like, anything too exciting. I think that they were very uneven in terms of quality. I don't, I mean, I read that, that was the first thing I read in July and I literally can't tell you anything about it. I do not remember. <laughs> I don't remember anything about that collection. So that probably should tell you something too. A lot of people are enjoying it. And again, it's short stories. So I am wholly on board with people reading short stories. So if you think it sounds interesting, I think it's worth giving a try. It just didn't really work for me. Okay, and then the next disappointment I had was The Con Artist by Fred Van Lint. I think that this came out in July, so I think you can get your hands on this. Uh, Bethany, a beautifully bookish Bethany, sent this to me because she wanted to talk about some weird things that happen in this. Um, and I would agree with her. I think that they are weird. I gave this a 2.5 star. I believe that's what she also gave it. Um, if I'd known this was noir, like a take on noir, that's set at Comic-Con, hence con artist. Um, I think I may have told her that this wasn't gonna be a good fit for me because I'm noir is a little bit of a hard sell for me. It's not always my favorite, though to be fair, I also read Hope Never Dies in July and that was a, another comedic take on noir that I thought was much more successful than this one. But that being said, I will grant that noir always has a little bit of a hard sell to me because there's a certain kind of tone and pacing in noir that I, it's just a little iffy for me. Um, this one, I just don't think, I think this was trying to be funny and just wasn't funny, at least in my opinion. And I think Bethany also felt that way. She's much more in the kind of Comic-Con world than I am. And neither, there was a lot of, I think, in jokes and she got them and didn't think they were funny. I didn't necessarily get them and still didn't think this was funny. There's also like, I guess mild spoiler, but I won't give you any context for this. Neo-Nazis come into this in a way that I felt like was just like, why? Like, it was just a weird, it was a choice. It was a choice that I was like not totally on board with. And I also think that there is some like, I don't think intentional, but moments of like, misogyny and playing on tropes that I think are kind of inherently rather misogynistic. And I don't, I don't think it was like malicious misogyny. So like, don't, I, I'm not trying to like knock him necessarily. I just think that um, there, there was a particular trope that I think just is inherently problematic. So anyway, all that to say, this was disappointing. This didn't work for me. Neither me nor Bethany really loved this one too much. So like, yeah, not, not so much a hit for me. And then my next disappointment was The Passage by Justin Cronin. Now this is like a hunk and long book. This is about 800 pages. And I was gonna do an entire review video of this, but I decided not to um, just because I don't, I just wasn't sure I would have an entire video's worth of things to say about it. I guess we're about to find out if that's the case. So I, this was a buddy read with Dane Reads and with Lisbeth and we had like an email chain going and I think we all kind of slowly realized that none of us like this book. This is an incredibly hyped like post-apocalyptic type book. I've heard so many people talk about this as like, this is like literary vampire, this is literary horror, this is literary post-apocalyptic, whatever. I just think that this book, so I've never read any like The Stand, I've not read anything else that's sort of in the same type of genre. Um, so actually you would think, 
I would like it better because I didn't have anything to compare it to. Um, and to, and I do think I ended up liking it maybe a little bit better than Dane or Lisbeth, but this just wasn't very good, I don't think. Like, it was fine. Like, it was okay. If I had not been doing this as a buddy read, I 100% would have DNF'd it around the 200 or 300 page mark because, guys, literally, the middle of this book, it's an 800 page book, and it should easily, like, generously be 500 pages, but honestly I think could have been a quite good book if it had only been 400 pages. This book just has like huge chunks of it that just should not be there. I don't know if they were, it's like a cash grab. I don't know if the editor just was too afraid to say something. Like, I don't know. But a lot of people absolutely love this book and I guess more power to them. I'm not going to be continuing in the series. This is a trilogy. I went and looked up the synopsis for each of those subsequent books because that's usually what I do if I'm not going to finish a series. And they sound even worse than this. So like, I don't know. Again, I know a lot of people really like this and I'm actually surprised that of the three of us who are reading it, none of us liked it. Um, I probably liked it the best because I would probably give it a two. I think I ended on a 2.5 because the more I thought about it, the more angry I became because I get angry about badly edited books. That's a whole thing. So I, I think I knocked it down to a 2.5, but I think Dane and uh, Elizabeth both were sort of like two star. Like none of us liked it. And uh, yeah, we all kind of were looking at each other like, do you like this? Uh, like what's the, why is this so hype? None of us could really totally figure that out. Really was not into it. A quick disappointment just because I did DNF this book so I don't have a lot to say about it other than why I DNF'd it. So I DNF'd My Plain Jane by, I think Cynthia Hold is at least one of the authors. There's like three of them. This was just a, a case of the tone and the style of the writing really not working for me. I think it was meant to be like playful and kind of fun and silly and it just read as like badly written to me. I think there's other people who would probably quite like this but yeah for me it just really didn't quite work. Uh, I didn't want to continue on in it and for a book that's that short like that kind of says something that I couldn't make myself get through it. Um, like I said it might be worth a try. I, I don't I also am somewhat a hard sell on the whole like authors and their characters being in the same world thing. That's not usually like my fave. Um, I know a lot of people do like that trope. It's just it's not my favorite. Um, so yeah I just disappointment because I didn't finish it and I think I had that on like one of my most anticipated books of the year videos and it's also a Jane Eyre retelling and I absolutely love Jane Eyre. It's my favorite book. So yeah, definitely disappointing that I didn't like it. Okay, and then my final disappointment is Killers of the Flower Moon. Now I know that that's like that's a thing to say. That's like a statement because this is a really... I think important story and the content of this book I absolutely loved and was fascinated by. So this is the story of, of the Osage tribe in Oklahoma and how uh, they're in the early 1900s they essentially were being systematically murdered for their oil rights and kind of the grand conspiracy in this part of Oklahoma to do that and to try to cover it up and um, this was like a formative case for the FBI. This is super interesting and I understand that this is going to be made into a movie and I would highly recommend seeing the movie. I just think as a book it didn't work that well. Like I still gave this three stars. Like it was perfectly fine but there's something about the tone and the writing voice that felt a little flat to me and it was a book that had so much like so many interesting things happening in it and something about the way that the story was communicated never really made it interesting to me which it wasn't like it was a hard sell to make it interesting to me because it's a fascinating story anyway um i just think that this is a little overhyped and actually when i mentioned it to my mom that i had was reading it and thinking oh maybe i'll get this for dad she was like oh, i read it and yeah i just didn't really connect with it as a as a book and so now I, I you know at least two people that i know of have had that experience so just like maybe proceed with caution on this one because it, it has gotten a lot of sort of hype as far as a nonfiction pick um and i do again I think the story is super interesting and I'm glad that it's getting attention. I just think that the, the actual book is not my favorite. Moving on to my surprises. Now I just realized that all three of my surprises are YA in some form or fashion. Uh, I'll start with A Court of Frost and Starlight by Sarah J Maas. I talked about this at length in my uh, middle of the month what I'm reading right now video. So if you want my full thoughts go there. Basically I was just very surprised that this book was a hardcover release. That's what it boils down to. I was like, girl, really? This is like some Kindle Unlimited paranormal smut, which I am here for, but like, 
that's not, I think, what your audience was wanting. So anyway, it was just sort of a surprise of like, girl, like, I can't believe that you're making hardcover dollars off of this. Another book that I think I talked about in my mid-month, uh, what I'm reading right now, so I won't go into it too much, was Sight Witch. I really love this book. This is my favorite of the three uh, Witchland books that I've read so far. It's the shortest. It's, uh, I would call this a short novel. They refer to it as a novella, but it's like 230 pages. That to me is a short novel. It's a prequel, but I would, if you are thinking about reading the series, please go ahead and read this first. That would be my recommendation because I think that this does a lot of setup in terms of the world and things that you should be looking for. And if I had read this first, I am almost 100% sure I would have enjoyed at a minimum which Wind Witch a lot better um, because I think this sets up some things in Wind Witch that I would have been much more interested in if I had known to be interested in them because without this context, I don't think they're as compelling. So my suggestion, uh, I humbly submit to you, start with Sight Witch, then go Truth Witch, then go Wind Witch. And then like me, you will be excited about Blood Witch because I think shit's about to get real. And then my third surprise was Never World Wake by Marissa Peschel. Peschel? I never know how to say her last name. So this was a YA mystery paranormal fantasy? I don't really, this is a genre bend. Like this is a YA genre bend that has strong mystery elements to it and strong supernatural elements to it. I'll say this, as I was reading through it, I was going along and thinking, this is fine. I would give this like, as a, like, as a YA kind of supernatural fantasy, whatever. It's like a three star book. This is good. I'm enjoying it. Um, I didn't think the mystery was especially compelling. Um, and I've been trying to read more YA mysteries in the last few months. At some point, I will have a recommendation video for you guys on that because I think I'm slowly but surely uh, making enough progress that I could speak to some things that I think are pretty good in that genre. But anyway, I was like, okay, this is a pretty good mystery. The last 50, 100 pages of that book in terms of like some elements that she brings up and some questions she introduces, um, I think knocked it up for me, pushed it up, not knocked. It didn't get knocked down, it got pushed up to a 3.5 star. So um, I don't think that there's enough interest happening in the first part of the book for it to truly be a four star, but I really enjoyed some of the ambiguity that she brought in in the ending. And I think that that piece of it was really successful. So it to me was a mystery that had um, a really satisfying conclusion, but not satisfying enough in the build up to it. But it surprised me because I was going along kind of thinking it was one thing and then the ending I really liked and really thought kind of took it a little bit to the next level. Um, so yeah, that was a surprise to me as I went because I was having one experience and then the ending did really kind of like recontextualize the entire book for me. Okay, and now we are to my hits. So two of these I'm not gonna talk about very long because I have full review videos of them, which I will link. The first of which is How to Be Safe by Tom McAllister. At the time I filmed that review, I think I said that I was giving this a 4.5. We've reached the end of the month. I'm still thinking about this book a lot. I'm still loving it and still really wanting people to read it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and bump this up to a five because I I think this is a book I will be thinking about for a very long time and will cite often as a favorite sort of like newly released literary fiction book that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, I just think that this, this was a really skillfully rendered work and I would really recommend it. And please, like, will somebody, if you end up reading this, will you let me know? Because like, I don't know anybody who's read this and I would love to talk about it with somebody. So yeah, go read this so I can talk about it with you. The next book uh, I'm gonna mention is I Can't Date Jesus by Michael Arseno, uh, which was a memoir that I really enjoyed. And again, I did make a review video, so I will link that somewhere. Yeah, I just think that this was a unique voice, a unique memoir. The author is actually super nice. He he found my video and was very kind to me about it. So that's always positive. We can say that this is a, a, a positive reader author experience. Now granted, I like the book, but still. Um, so yeah, he seems nice. It's a really interesting memoir. Watch my video. And I know at least a few of you based on that have, have read it and enjoyed it. So seems like uh, people who find it seem to like it. Yeah, it's not getting a lot of hype, but it's one that I really enjoyed. Okay, and then finally, my last hit is a book called The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. Huang? Huang? I'm not totally sure. This was a really, 
thought-provoking contemporary romance. Now, this book, uh, if you are, have seen the cover, um, is a contemporary romance that is getting a push into summer, like, beach read type thing. It's gotten a non-humiliating cover, which always lets you know that the publisher thinks that non-romance readers, non-typical romance readers might also enjoy it. If you are a romance reader, don't be deceived by the sort of more chick -litty, women's fiction-y type cover. It is a romance, it just has a less clenchy cover. Um, no man titty, sadly, so maybe next time. This book is really interesting for a few reasons and kind of building off last month's musings I was having about like alpha heroes. This is another tricky romance trope that I actually think in this case was done maybe as well as it can be done. Um, I still, I didn't give it a five star, I gave it a four star just because the trope itself I have some problems with. Like I don't, and this book I think has proven to me that I don't know that I'll ever be able to entirely overcome my problems with this trope. So anyway, what I'm talking about is that um, this book is about a white American woman who is autistic who hires the services of a male sex worker who is uh, Vietnamese American. And that trope, the sex worker and client fall in love trope is always problematic to me just because there are underlying power dynamics that just make it a little icky and like ugh, even though like in some cases and in this case I think that the author is explicitly exploring those power dynamics she is explicitly calling them out she has scenes where she's trying to show that these dynamics are being overcome and the fact that the heroine is um, she essentially hires a sex worker because she, because she's autistic, she doesn't like to be touched, but she um, kind of feels like her parents' expectation is that she's going to get married and give them grandchildren. She feels a need to fulfill that expectation for them, and so she wants to become more comfortable with being touched in a sexual way. The hero, um, I think because that's sort of the dynamic that she's kind of in the position of being taught or um, needing something emotionally from the hero that he, he has more power in, I think it's it balances out that relationship probably as much as it can be and that's why I want to say I think that this is the best version of that trope I've ever seen. I like that the author was aware of some of the issues that could come up. I liked how she tried to put them on equal footing in s different scenes in terms of making each of them kind of have moments of a little bit of the emotional upper hand in some ways. Um, I just think that that trope, what I've learned from this, is never going to be one that I can 100% settle into because I just am always aware of the socioeconomic and like cl like all of the bigger macro factors happening. And I think it's, I think the other thing I've realized, it's easier for me to be less uh, about this if it's a male sex worker as opposed to a female sex worker um, and the conditions in which they, anyway. I could go on about this for a long time, I won't. I will just say that I thought this was a really well-written book, really interesting, and if you're less in your head about that trope, I think you'll absolutely love this book. It's super well-written. I really like the family dynamics that were going on. I like that the heroine's autism was not portrayed as something that was like her character flaw or something like wrong with her. It was more just like, this is who I am, and like that means I have certain strengths and certain weaknesses and I'm working with it. Do you know what I mean? So like, I like that it didn't feel ableist, I guess maybe is what I'm getting at. I just felt like it was really unique in terms of the types of representation it had. I thought that the those representations were used in a way that really served the story um, in ways that I thought were different and things that you don't always see in contemporary books. Yeah, I just really enjoyed it and I think it's definitely worth picking up if you like uh, kind of like something light, romantic. There are sexy times. If you're not used to reading that, you can always skip, but sexy times are pretty good. It's just a really, really good book. Thought-provoking challenge, like made me kind of have to uh, externalize some of my thoughts about a particular trope in the genre and yeah, it was just all around a really positive reading experience. I think that will do it for me for today. Uh, yeah, like I said, July itself was a really awesome month with mixed reading results, but like, 
that's just life. Sometimes you get a good reading month, sometimes you don't. And you know what? I had a good enough month in every other respect that like I'll take a kind of uneven reading month. The month of August is going to be uh, really exciting because I'm gonna have some time off work. Also, um, something that I started rereading in July and will continue in August is that the Kate Dan the last Kate Daniels book comes out at the end of August. I am doing an epic reread and I am reviewing every single book in the series leading up to the last one. I will be posting those. That will not get in the way of my normal posting schedule. So if you have zero interest in those books, like I will still have other videos at the end of August. But just FYI, there are gonna be a lot of Kate Daniels Daniel's videos up on here because like this is how I'm pre-gaming and getting ready to receive this gift of the last book. Um, I'm really, really excited. I will be very clear about which of those reviews are spoilery or non-spoilery. I'm definitely gonna make sure that the first book review is non-spoilery because I wanna try to sell you on why you should be reading this series because it's so good and so enjoyable. The ones that get further along, I probably will do spoilers because like by then you should like you, I hope, have read the book if you're watching the video. So um, anyway, look for that coming up in August. And I don't think I need to tell you guys anything else. Um, thank you for being awesome. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that will do it. I hope you're having a really lovely day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.